So good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, first edition of uh, 2022 of our monthly meetups organized by Click AI, the Computational Linguistics in Quebec Consortium. Uh, my name is uh, Fabrizio Gatti. I'm a programmer specialized in natural language processing. I'm working at the University of uh, Montreal and uh, for uh, Ivado. Uh, once again, um, today we have three very engaging talks under the theme of uh, productization of uh, state-of-the-art large NLP models. I'll briefly introduce the presentation. So we have a presentation from uh, Louis Stansdahl, who's going to uh, present Accelerating Transformers with Hugging Face, Infinity and Optimum. We have a presentation from Mehdi Rezagolizadeh, who's going to uh, present uh, a talk about knowledge distillation in NLP. And finally, a presentation by Mathieu Fortier about productizing modern NLP. Uh, just a, a side note, that last presentation is not going to be recorded, but the first two uh, will be. So before we start, I'm going to ask everyone to uh, mute yourselves, please. So turn off uh, your microphone so that we can enjoy the presentations without any background noise. And uh, turn off your cameras as well so that we uh, have the presentations uh, distraction free. Um, every talk is going to be followed by a five to 10 minute question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please write them down and uh, you, you're going to have plenty of time at the end of each presentation to ask them. If you wish, you, could, you can ask the, your questions in French and they're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to translate them for you if you want. Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask uh, persons that have just joined to turn off uh, their microphones so that we can have uh, no background noise. So let's move on now to the first presentation by uh, Louis Tunstall, who works at Hugging Face. Um, his presentation is Accelerating Transformers with Hugging Face Infinity and Optimum. Louis Stunstall is a machine learning engineer in the open source team at the very popular Hugging Face. He has several years experience building machine learning powered applications for startups and enterprises in the domains of NLP, topological data analysis and time series. His current work focuses on developing tools for the NLP community and educating, educating people on how to use them effectively, a very noble cause. Uh, Louis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much for this um, kind introduction, Fabrizio, and also thank you very much to Click AI for <clears throat> having me here today. So um, I thought I'd like to talk about, um, you know, at Hugging Face, I think many people are aware of the open source libraries like Transformers and um, data sets. Um, but quite recently, um, we've been working on a new open source library called Optimum, um, which tries to kind of bridge the gap between um, making Transformers or getting the power of Transformers into the enterprise setting. So how do you handle questions of um, performance with latency and throughput. And then I'll also talk about Infinity, which is kind of a, say, paid uh, product or a solution which wraps all of the complexity that goes into these optimization techniques into more or less a, a one-line one um, uh, deploy um, command. So just a little bit about me. So Fabrizio already mentioned um, what I kind of do at Hugging Face. So I, I work on the Transformers library um, and also the datasets library. Um, and primarily my role there is to kind of um, export the transform models into these um, special serialized formats that we can then use in um, deployment in things like Optimum and Infinity. And on the other side, I also work um, on the education part of, of the open source team. So we have a course, um, if you go to huggingface.co slash course, um, you can learn about um, applying transformers in many um, different NLP applications. 
And I'm also a co-author on a book with Tom Wolfe and Leandra von Vera about applying NLP with transformers. And this should come out, I think, next week. So this book has um, a fairly um, wide coverage of many different applications, including optimization. So if you're interested in what you see today, um, I encourage you to check it out. OK, so the plan of attack um, is I thought I'd just set the scene um, kind of like, you know, why are we here? Uh, why are we talking about these things called transformers? Followed by a kind of introduction to Optimum, the open source library, and then wrapping up with a quick look at Infinity and the kind of um, performance results that we're we're seeing with it right now. So, kind of to to get started, let's um, sort of you know think about you know what why is it that NLP is suddenly like well not suddenly but for the last few years has been like kind of like you know the hottest topic some in some sense in in machine learning and you, you can sort of see this across different applications so one of the ones that I find particularly impressive is this um, uh, report from Microsoft where they talk about how they had been engaging in this path to improve their translator um, and scaling out to, to more and more languages and you can sort of see here that <clears throat> um, before 2016, they were using kind of like statistical machine translation techniques, um, more of like the classic um, linguistic based approaches. And then around 2016, they started adopting neural approaches. And there's kind of like a kind of linear trend somehow um, here. And then suddenly the transformer um, is released by Google and you start to see uh, a massive or a fairly steep growth um, in the number of languages you're adding. And part of the reason to, of that is that the transformer architecture, as we kind of know, has these like properties that allow us to um, train very large scale models. Um, and in the con context of translation, it allows you to kind of integrate many more different languages together. Um, and this is exhibited both through Microsoft, but also through other models like XLM Roberta from Facebook. And the other thing that um, I guess we're all familiar with now is that almost all of the kind of benchmarks that um, we use in the field to, to measure, say, progress in inverted commas, they kind of got broken um, by models like BERT and the descendants of BERT. And so you can see this here, for example, um, the, the famous squad benchmark for question answering. Um, roughly when BERT came out, you start to see a fairly dramatic um, improvement in performance. And then you see similar things here for identity recognition. And what's interesting here is that, you know, for, for several years, I mean, this um, named entity recognition benchmark was more or less flat. Um, and then suddenly you start to see, you know, this kind of this growth in performance. And I think we can always, um, you know, talk about the, the, the use of benchmarks. Like, you know, is it really um, the kind of tasks that we care about um, as humans? Um, but nevertheless, from the perspective of just, you know, figuring out what kinds of tasks are these models quite good at, we can see that nowadays it's getting <clears throat> harder and harder to design NLP benchmarks that transformers aren't particularly good at. And this isn't just for NLP. Um, we've we've seen um, just last year that DeepMind um, made a fairly dramatic improvement in um, protein um, structure prediction. So you may have heard of this um, release called AlphaFold2, <clears throat> where they integrate transformer networks um, to basically predict how these proteins kind of unravel in three dimensions. And um, more recently um, from Facebook or Meta, I keep forgetting that they've changed their name, um, is that you can also use transformers um, in, in other domains that aren't just NLP. Um, for example, you can actually just work on raw audio now um, using a kind of GPT style model. And this allows you to, to sort of skip the standard <clears throat> approach where you have to take some audio, convert it to text, and then convert it back to audio. This kind of just lets you shortcut the whole thing. And then, of course, there's this like famous result from um, Google about, um, you know, when they integrated BERT into Google Search, um, they they sort of claim that this gave the biggest leap forward in the past five years. And, you know, I think nowadays people sometimes seem to be complaining about Google Search, but nevertheless, um, by Google's own metrics, um, this was a big, a big deal. So what you'll kind of see that is the common thread here is that, okay, transformers, they're, they're great um, and everyone's excited, but, you know, kind of traditionally, this has been the kind of domain of, of large organizations um, or organizations with deep pockets. 
And so at Hugging Face, what we're trying to do is um, basically bring this technology um, to as many um, people as possible. And if we were thinking about a meme, it would basically be, you know, a humble data scientist or a machine learning engineer um, or a researcher just asking, you know, can I please have some of the state of the art um, uh, cake and eat it. So at Hugging Face, the, the way that we think about um, how we can kind of democratize transformers or make um, this technology available kind of has two directions or two dimensions. So on one side, there's the, the community um, built around the open source library. So the open source library of transformers and the surrounding ecosystem. And we rely very heavily on our community to um, both contribute um, new architectures or new implementations um, to transformers, but also to um, build and train new models and contribute new data sets to the Hugging Face Hub. And then this kind of gives you that kind of uh, a feed feedback effect where you can then other people can use those models for their own applications um, or for their own research. Um, so the community side of things, I think maybe you're quite familiar with if you've, if you've worked with um, the Hugging Face Hub. I won't be going into that too much today. What I want to focus on is the other dimension, which is that, um, you know, outside of being able to train a model or, you know, interact with a model, uh, a very important question um, is that, you know, all those applications that I was showing you, they were um, largely about, you know, applying transformers in domains where you, you really have strong latency requirements. You know, imagine if Google search, you know, took, I don't know, 20 or 30 milliseconds to um, give you re a result, you would kind of notice that and your kind of user experience um, would feel degraded. And so today's talk is going to be about how can we tackle this other side and make uh, transformers more efficient for businesses um, that you know really have to deal with these latency requirements. So on the efficiency side, um, there are like roughly two approaches um, how, how we've been thinking about this at Hugging Face. So on, on one side, the idea is that you take an existing model, um, something like BERT or you know any other kind of variant of BERT, and then you can ask yourself, okay, um, this model, it has some number of parameters um, or number of weights, and we don't necessarily need um, all of those weights um, to get similar performance. So one of the earliest um, uh, sort of innovations in this field or in this space was the um, creation of distill BERT. So this um, uses a technique called knowledge distillation, which I think you'll hear about in the next talk. And the basic idea is that you have two models. You have a model called the teacher, which is BERT, and you try to imbue some of that knowledge into a student, which is typically much smaller. And in this case, with Dilbert, it's roughly 40% um, smaller. And this means that then you can use that pre-trained model um, to do fine tuning roughly 60% faster um, than just standard BERT. And you only pay like a, a small, you know, 2% accuracy hit um, on glue, for example. Then the other thing that um, we've been working on at Hugging Face has been in the direction of pruning. Um, so the idea here is that um, many of the weights in the transformer networks or in the transformer layers um, aren't necessarily very informative or useful when it comes to making um, predictions. And so um, Victor San, Tom Wolf, and Sasha Rush have been working a lot on figuring out how can you kind of progressively delete weights um, in, in the transformer layers um, in the process of fine tuning. And so instead of just taking a, a trained model and then just figuring out, okay, which weights should I delete? The idea here is that you delete the weights in a kind of adaptive process um, through the fine tuning um, steps. And this paper showed that um, you can actually delete something like 90-ish percent of the weights in models like BERT, and you only pay like a, a you know, one to 2% hit in accuracy. Um, but the trouble is that um, the, the modern kind of compute architecture that we use, for example, CPUs, they're not really well designed um, for dealing with sparse um, networks or sparse matrices. And so um, even though you have a very sparse or let's say um, small model, when you actually want to run it on, on you know, a standard CPU, you find that you don't get much of a speed up. And so um, Francois Lagunas, one of the researchers at Hugging Face, he then um, implemented 
um, a kind of drop-in replacement um, for the PyTorch linear layer. And if you combine these two things, then you can suddenly see that you get around a two to four X speed up, um, but you can also delete roughly half to 90% of the weights. So the, these are kind of the general techniques where um, we provide the tools so that people in the community can kind of train or fine tune these models in a much faster way. So the other way to look at this is that maybe it's not so much about a question of training per se, um, or finding you know clever techniques to compress our models. Um, another way to, to think about how we can make um, transformers faster, um, both for training and for inference, is to worry about the sort of backend or the hardware side of things. And so um, you're probably familiar um, that in PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, you can essentially optimize the graph or the computational graph of your models. Um, using techniques like torch script um, or you know if you convert your model into the own and X format you can then optimize this using things like own X runtime and Nvidia tensor RT and there's this kind of like general um, trend in industry right now um, with many of these um, hardware manufacturers to build their kind of own frameworks um, which kind of interface to their own hardware so that then if you're running on NVIDIA GPUs, you can get kind of optimal performance. Um, but generally what you'll find is that, you know, if you switch your backend to some different chip, then you'll have to learn a kind of different set of um, interfaces. And so this trend of, of hardware kind of specific model optimization um, is really what motivated um, the creation of Optimum. And the basic idea of this library um, is to enable um, practitioners, typically in industry, um, to be able to both train and run their models on very diverse types of hardware. So we're talking about things that, you know, you don't typically find on Google Colab. We're talking about very specific um, chips that have been designed specifically for deep learning workloads. So you can see an example of such a chip here from a company called Graphcore. Um, they've designed a, a chip called the Intelligence Processing Unit or the IPU. And um, the idea here is that um, instead of kind of using the same kind of architecture that a GPU has, you try to design from the bottom up something that is better suited for the types of operations that happen in, in deep learning. And the idea here is that by partnering with companies like Graphcore, um, we can then integrate transformers more tightly um, with their hardware. And one of the sort of design principles um, in Optimum is to provide the same ease of use that was inherent or is inherent in Hugging Face Transformers. So I just want to show you a kind of quick example um, of what that looks like. So if you're familiar with um, the Transformers library, um, you'll know that um, we have what are called auto classes, which allow you to basically import um, any sort of checkpoint. So this could be um, a pre-trained model on the Hugging Face Hub, or it could be on your on your hard drive. And these auto classes, they're, they're designed for certain tasks. So you could have an auto model for sequence classification or an auto model for question answering. And once you've picked um, your checkpoint, you can then load this directly um, from the hub or from your disk by using the from pre-trained method. And this is pretty standard in like the kind of workflow that um, you're using in NLP where you say, okay, I need to start with some sort of pre-trained model and then I want to fine tune it. And the next thing that's like needed basically to run this IPU um, is you just have to define a configuration. So again, this is something that you can um, directly download um, from a model on the hub or you can just have your own file. And this is kind of like just configuring all of the um, sort of IPU specific um, parameters that are needed um, to, to spin up the job. And then after this, it's very similar to the Transformers library. You, you have a trainer which basically wraps um, both the, the model and the IPU configuration, as well as some training arguments um, and the data sets that you're training on. And you don't really have to learn anything else. I mean, this is all abstracted away. So, um, if you've ever had to kind of train other types of deep learning models on different hardware, at least for me, the experience has always been a fairly painful one of needing to kind of, you know, clone a repo, install some very random SDKs, maybe learn a bit of C++, 
And the idea between Optimum is to just kind of abstract all that complexity away um, for the developers. So this is an example of training on IPUs. Um, but the other aspect um, with Optimum that we're focusing on is around inference. So one of the things that um, we've observed um, in industry is that the sort of most common way that um, people try to speed up the predictions um, of transform models or just deep learning models in general um, is using a technique called weight quantization. So you can see an example here um, of what this quantization um, approach is about. The basic idea is that we typically have all of the weights um, in our model in something like floating point, you know, 32 bit <coughs> um, numbers, uh, precision. And with quantization, the idea is that you basically map the, the kind of range of values that your, um, um, your, your numbers can take into some lower range, which is typically um, like in the kind of integer range. So you might have some like 8-bit integer, um, whether it's signed or not. And then by mapping your numbers into this reduced range, you can then speed up your matrix multiplications because you're now having to deal basically with less, um, less numbers of uh, floating point uh, computations. So visually what this looks like, you can see here in this image here that this is just one of the layers in um, BERT. Um, just looking at, I think, um, you know, one of the heads. And what you have, you see when you quantize, is you'll basically kind of discretize um, the, the weights somehow. And the question, or well, the main challenges that you typically face when you, when you do this, um, is that you're kind of converting um, a, a model which has been trained using these like dense um, numbers, all these dense vectors. And now you're, you're applying this quantization procedure to them. And the thing that you'll often find in practice is that, you know, not all of the operations um, in the network have a quantized counterpart. And so you'll have some kind of issues uh, figuring out, okay, which parts of the computational graph can I quantize specifically? And then you have to pick some choice of like, okay, do I do dynamic quantization? Do I do static quantization? Which is where you try to kind of feed some batch of data through the model and figure out what is the optimal um, weights to quantize. And then you have to pick again, you know, what type of data type um, do I want to quantize my, my original model down to? And so even though like PyTorch and TensorFlow, they will show you these like really nice tutorials, like, oh, look how easy it is to quantize BERT. Um, the experience, at least for me in practice, has been that, you know, that works um, if you're, you know, dealing with like a very simple problem, but almost always you've got some extra custom um, pieces and then this, this process gets a bit more complicated. So the idea with Optimum <clears throat> is, um, again, to partner with um, hardware uh, manufacturers, um, for example, Intel, and to integrate their own um, sort of techniques and interfaces for doing this like inference speed up. And one of the ones that you can see here is an example from their um, library called the Intel Neural Compressor. And what this does is this basically addresses those common challenges I mentioned. So figuring out like, you know, which quantization scheme do you pick, um, which is the best choice of um, uh, data type to quantize to, um, what is the accuracy drop going to be if I, you know, tune one of the knobs, um, for example, you know, how many cores I use, all that kind of stuff. And it basically applies a kind of recipe um, with some sort of optimization um, techniques that allow you to kind of figure out what is the best choice of these knobs that you can tune um, to quantize the model to get the best performance according to some uh, metric, which is defined by this evaluation function. And again, the idea between in Optimum is to make this as simple as we can for, for the developer. So you more or less just import a model which looks very similar to a transformers model. You define a configuration for the quantization and then you more or less fit it and you're done. And um, you know, we're seeing that in this case, you can typically get around a two times reduction in the size of transform models, which then translates roughly into a two to four X um, reduction in the latency. So this is the, the optimum side, um, which is kind of the, the low level, so to speak, um, part of the problem. Um, and then just, you know, to wrap up, I'd like to talk a little bit um, about infinity, um, which kind of abstracts away this complexity um, one, one level higher. 
So the sort of, let's say, sales pitch of what Infinity is, is that it's a, a containerized product um, where basically you take all of those things I told you about. So we're talking about things like quantization and pruning, and you wrap this into a service, which is more or less um, just a Docker command, or it's just a Docker container that you can then deploy um, in your own production environment. So the reason why um, we think this is a problem that's that's worth tackling is that we know from working with our own customers at Hugging Face um, that industrializing or productionizing transformers is typically difficult for kind of three main reasons. So the first one is that um, you need to set up your whole inference infrastructure. And so if you're like a small to mid-sized company that is maybe just beginning on this kind of transition from, let's say, the traditional CPU-based setup towards something that is more GPU-heavy, then getting the whole um, infrastructure set up um, is often quite a challenge. And then the second part is the sort of optimization um, techniques I mentioned. And this was about like, okay, which pruning method do I use? Should I do knowledge distillation or should I do quantization? And these techniques are like not in the traditional um, sort of data scientist or machine learning engineer toolkit, um, at least for now. And so a lot of the time, you know, myself included when I was in my old job, we used to sort of have to learn this stuff on the fly. You just sort of figure out, okay, I need to make this model uh, meet these objectives. And so you spend a lot of time um, kind of teaching yourself um, how these things work. And so some of the customers we work with tell us that, you know, they would prefer if their engineers were focused on things, you know, more about the solving the business problem rather than the optimization one. And then the last one is just what I mentioned before that um, just because you're able to optimize um, your model using, say, quantization, there is this additional step of trying to figure out, okay, what is like the best choice of hardware? And if I swap out my hardware, do I have to then, you know, redo everything and reconfigure everything myself? So the, the kind of idea is that if you look at the landscape right now, um, on one extreme, you have what we call closed solutions. So these are just basically APIs, um, which are things like, you know, GPT-3 from OpenAI, also from Amazon Comprehend and so on. And these have the benefit of being, you know, just a, a HTTP request. You send your payload, you get responses back. Um, but one of the limitations we find there is that you sort of have no insight into like, you know, how the model is really working. Um, it's not your model. Um, maybe you can't send your data to the US, or those kind of things. So one level deeper is sort of have your own cloud. So maybe you're using tools from, from Google, like Google Cloud Vertex or SageMaker. And these give you a sort of more fine-grained control on how you train and deploy your models. Um, but kind of as far as our experience has been is they typically don't dive deep into the optimization side. So things like SageMaker, they give you really great um, tools for training models and deploying them, but not the optimization part. And then of course you can roll your own solution using things like Optimum. But as I was just mentioning, you know, you have to kind of be a low level developer and, you know, not every um, company that wants to, you know, use NLP is in, is in this um, in this boat. So the way Optimum works is there's basically two pieces to it. Um, there's one thing called the multiverse container. So at Hugging Face, we have this kind of joke about the Avengers or the Marvel series. So everything in this whole Infinity um, product is, is based around the Avengers. And the idea here is that um, you basically have optimization as a service. So you can provide us with, um, you know, the architecture um, that you're interested in, the task, the hardware. And um, from this, you can basically either do it yourself, you, you just can send these details to the optimization container and it will then give you an optimized model in return, basically using these kind of techniques that I mentioned with Optimum. Um, or um, the other approach is that you just provide us with those details and then we optimize it for you. Um, but this is the sort of first step. And then the second thing is that once you've now got an optimized model, you can then uh, deploy it using this uh, thing we call an infinity container, which is basically um, a Docker container, which has both the optimization of the model, but it also has optimized pre-processing and post-processing. So if you're used to working with NLP uh, workflows, things like, for example, question answering, typically have a fair amount of pre-processing you need to do on the inputs, but also on the post-processing to convert those back into extracted answers.
And this gives you essentially uh, an endpoint that you can monitor um, entirely on your own cloud or if you're using Google or AWS. And the basic idea here to see how it works is that you've kind of have, say, an engineer who does this optimization process. They then store that model, um, for example, on S3 bucket. And then an end user um, can just query the endpoint from the Infinity container. And then you're more or less done as far as we're concerned from the optimization perspective. So in practice, the way this looks is you more or less just run a Docker command. So you just provide the location um, of where your model is. And then you're done. You'll have an endpoint, which you can then um, query, and then you'll get your um, payload back in response. And just to give you an idea of like what kind of um, impact this has compared to say vanilla um, sort of transform models, um, we can have a look at some results. And um, here I'm showing the, the throughput um, that you can um, see for a BERT um, based model. And you can see here in the yellow line, um, this is basically the number of requests per second um, as a function of the sequence length of the inputs. So when you've got kind of quite small um, inputs, then the, the sort of gain in, in the optimized model versus the vanilla PyTorch model um, is, is quite significant. We're looking at around um, you know, a 5x gain in throughput. And as you increase the sequence length, you would typically then expect your throughput to decrease. But nevertheless, the, the sort of relative difference um, between the vanilla um, PyTorch model and the optimized one is on the order of you know, two to um, three times um, in your throughput. And you know, depending on your use case, this is usually a, a good thing because this means that you can typically um, process you know, many more um, sort of requests or Typically, if you're doing kind of like a batch-based approach, you can do this um, using less resources, so you can save costs. And the other one, or the other metric that is often um, quite important is to worry about latency. So kind of how quickly do we expect our requests to come? And here you can see that um, looking at the percentiles, so here you've got um, the max latency in yellow, the 99th percentile in red, and the 95th percentile in blue, you see it's pretty stable um, as you increase the, the sequence length. And you can see that, you know, when we're dealing with small sequences on a CPU, we're in the range of <clears throat> uh, one to four milliseconds. And then this increases up um, as you increase the sequence length. But these numbers are also reduced if you're running on a GPU. And what we typically find is that for kind of BERT-based models or encoder-based models, um, it's around a factor of three faster on a GPU. So as I mentioned before, if you can reduce your latency, you can save your costs, you can scale your infra, and you can also then enable um, certain like products or certain um, workflows that weren't possible. And um, kind of today, what we support, just pardon me one sec, <coughs> we currently support um, encoder-based models. This has been the sort of most requested one from our customers. And these are the tasks ranging from things like text classification to named entity recognition, and then also to embedding extraction. If you're doing things like search, you typically want to extract um, the embeddings from these models so that you can do things like semantic search. And these are the different hardware um, backends that we support uh, currently on Infinity. So I think with that, I might be just on time and we can take some questions. Thank you so much. Uh, it was very interesting presentation about democratizing something that is extremely useful. <laughs> uh, so we have about uh, four or five minutes for questions. You can ask your questions in English or French. If you want, you can use the raise hand tool in Teams uh, in the upper right corner of uh, the application, or you can write your uh, questions in the chat if you wish. So uh, we have a question from uh, Guy. Uh, Guy, if you wish to uh, unmute your microphone and ask your question. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just curious the, that you spend so much time optimizing big, really huge models. Why can't you optimize when you're learning so that you start? <laughs> it's a bit strange to start. 
with really from which you spend making them smaller. Why can't you learn them smaller? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And um, I think this is arguably a direction that the field is going in. So, for example, um, if you look at something like GPT-3 at one extreme, um, we've got like 175 billion parameters and you can't, you know, fit this on a single GPU and all these kind of challenges. And um, just um, just last year, um, there were two interesting um, approaches to, to dramatically reduce the model size using techniques like training on certain types of prompts um, or in the case of DeepMind, they have a paper or a model called Retro, which kind of combines retrieval with language modeling to reduce the size dramatically. And um, I think what we'll see um, is this trend towards being able to train smaller models, but with the same kind of performance of these, you know, much bigger, more powerful ones um, will, will come. That's more like a training question. Um, the other one is, I think, maybe asking, OK, why can't we make the known techniques, for example, pruning really work? Because if pruning really could work on the hardware that we have today, um, then in principle, what you could do is you could start with like a huge network and you could just, you know, gradually delete and remove these weights so that in the end you may only have, let's say, one to five percent of the original size that you started with. Um, just figuring out which weights are kind of not very important for the, for the task at hand. And at Hugging Face, we have like our own bias of what we think is good for that. We have a technique called um, movement pruning, um, but it doesn't yet quite work on the hardware that exists today. Um, so um, if I, I think if like the hardware manufacturers um, provide better support for, say, sparse computations, then we could imagine um, that we would no longer need to do this like, you know, post training optimization. But uh, that's just my biased opinion. <clears throat> Thank you. So maybe uh, uh, I think we're so we have a, a time for one quick question from uh, David Torres. David, the thank voice you. Is. So very nice presentation. Uh, the question is about the hardware. When you use the optimization, when you want to do the optimization, uh, should be necessary to be very similar to that one that we use to train the model. So I will need a GPU to do the distill a transformer, or can I use a less power to achieve a semi similar uh, accuracy when I do mm -hmm. optimization? Or, or what will be the, the good conditions to have in a hardware mm -hmm. to do this process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so so th there's two th sides to this. Um, there's, there's a side which is about training models on um, special hardware. So for example, um, we've used GPUs up until now as like the majority of um, um, say training models, but you know things like the IPU from GraphCore or the TPU from Google, they're like a kind of new approach to thinking about how you do this in a clever way. Um, but once you've trained your model, at the end of the day, you just have a, a computational graph basically. So you've just got some you know set of nodes and some operators. And right. what we tend to do at Hugging Face is we tend to favor exporting these models into a format called ONNX. Um, it's kind of a serialization of, of the graph. And then once you've got this kind of intermediate representation, basically this kind of graph like structure, you can then um, optimize it or let's say deploy it on kind of any type of hardware, more or less. I mean, th there are some limitations, but to a large extent, many of the Intel um, CPUs um, will run this kind of graph um, in, a, in a, an optimized way. So the short answer is that it generally doesn't matter if you train on a GPU and then deploy on a CPU. Um, but the, the bigger question is figuring out, you know, what is the optimal, say, CPU or let's say GPU that you want to do inference on? Thank you. Thanks. So, uh... We thank again uh, our presenter, Lewis Dunstall from Hugging Face.
And we're going to move on now to the second presentation from Mehdi Rizagolizadeh, who works uh, at Huawei. He's going to present efficient data augmentation for knowledge distillation in LP. Mehdi is a staff machine learning research scientist at Huawei's Montreal Research Center, leading the NLP team. Mehdi obtained his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the Center of Intelligent Machines at McGill in December of 2016, and he joined Huawei uh, in uh, 2017. His research focuses on uh, different deep learning and NLP projects, such as efficient pre-trained language models, model compression from NLP, obviously, and generative adversarial networks. So, um, Miti, if you, uh, th the floor is Hi. yours, and uh, we thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, actually, for your introduction, and uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about our some of our works on efficient data augmentation uh, for knowledge distillation uh, in NLP. Uh, so, uh, I want to also thank Luis for his great presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, is it full screen for you? Everything is okay? It's perfect. Okay, perfect. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm in my presentation, uh, I will talk about model compression for pre-trained language models. Uh, I will briefly introduce knowledge distillation for people who might not know, and uh, then I'll go uh, to data augmentation uh, in NLP and uh, how we are going to improve data augmentation uh, for knowledge distillation specifically would come next. So we have two uh, particular solutions, mate KD and minimax scan and KD. Uh, that I'll uh, introduce and then I'll uh, summarize uh, my presentation. So uh, as you all know, like in recent years, uh, pre-training plus fine tuning has become a sort of trend in NLP. Uh, we have a lot of uh, pre-trained models now available in the literature, in, like on public domain. Uh, the main, uh, let's say, uh, point here is uh, we pre-train like our transformer model or any model actually on a huge amount of data uh, and then uh, after pre-training uh, for any downstream task uh, you can fine-tune your pre-trained model or like now with the emergence of like uh, uh, prompt-based techniques you can like even use prompts for adapting your model or just fast adapting your model to uh, any downstream task. But uh, still we have two phases like pre-training, fine-tuning uh, or like adapting the model uh, after uh, pre-training. So, so far uh, so good. Uh, the main issue uh, I think uh, it's already mentioned uh, by Luis as well, that like one major issue would be uh, like for these pre-trained language models and uh, their size and the number of uh, like uh, parameters, uh, they are growing over time <laughs> to improve their performance. So like uh, if we compare uh, the first version of GPT uh, that we had like for, with just 12 layers, uh, then Bert came and uh, like uh, later on uh, Roberta, Bart, XLM, T5, like uh, now we have uh, GPT-3, Pangu Alpha, Gopher from uh, Google, like uh, all like uh, let's say over time the number of parameters of these models grow and grow. Uh, so, how are we going to deploy these models on, uh, especially, uh, let's say, edge devices would be uh, very challenging, uh, actually, uh, very, yeah, challenging task for us. Uh, so, one particular solution would be uh, we get these pre-trained, large pre-trained models, and then we apply model compression uh, or compress these models, but uh, there are, let's say, a lot of different uh, 
neural model compression techniques in the literature like pruning uh, like, uh, or like sharing parameters like low rank factorization and knowledge distillation and uh, quantization. So uh, for pruning, for example, you just uh, focus on, let's say, uh, the most significant weights of your uh, network. Like I don't go to the details of how you can uh, do pruning, but uh, mostly like uh, uh, the uh, rationale behind pruning is to remove uh, on insignificant weights of your model uh, to be able to speed up uh, actually uh, your inference. Uh, for low rank factorization, like uh, there are many, uh, let's say, tensor decomposition, matrix decomposition techniques, SVD, like that you can use uh, to uh, reduce the number of, uh, or the, the reduce the rank of your, let's say, matrices uh, or tensors and uh, save some uh, let's say memory on that for knowledge distillation we will see in a uh, minute actually in our next slide so uh, that would be the main focus of this talk for quantization that would really depend on your hardware that uh, like what uh, sort of bit operation your hardware supports but uh, if let's say your uh, full precision model had 32 bit weights then uh, you can reduce it maximum to one bit. Uh, so you can get uh, up to 32 time compression by uh, quantizing your weights. Uh, there are many challenges for quantization as well. Like it really depends on hardware after, let's say uh, you do quantization for quantization process. Uh, like you can do uh, like post training quantization or quantization aware training. Uh, that's not the focus of uh, my talk here. Uh, uh, then, uh, so among these compression techniques, uh, I'll uh, mention mostly or I'll focus mostly on knowledge distillation. And uh, one main reason is uh, actually knowledge distillation uh, is generic. Uh, you can, uh, or, or among the compression techniques that I uh, introduced, like uh, KD would be uh, one of the most generic uh, approaches uh, we have. It's not very hardware dependent. It's uh, it, uh, it can be used for compression purposes. It was the main motivation when like for like uh, emergence of knowledge distillation and later on like these days uh, knowledge distillation is used also for model improvement like uh, in a sort of like uh, self uh, distillation uh, setup that uh, your model become its own teacher during training. Uh, so uh, that being said, uh, we uh, will uh, introduce knowledge distillation in a bit more detail. So uh, initially uh, knowledge distillation was proposed in 2006 uh, by uh, Basila et al. And uh, it was at that time actually uh, they had uh, an ensemble of uh, models and uh, uh, the task was a sort of regression task. They didn't want to keep all these models for inference, so uh, they tried to transfer the knowledge of like these individual models to a single model uh, to be able to do uh, their regression task. But uh, generally, uh, generally speaking, knowledge distillation uh, became uh, mostly uh, famous or it recognized as knowledge distillation mostly in 2015 after the uh, paper of Hinton et al. Uh, so uh, the main thing there is like we have a teacher model and a student model. The teacher model is already uh, trained on a specific uh, data and uh, the teacher has a good sort of uh, generalization uh, ability and then we want to transfer this uh, uh, generalizability to like uh, a smaller student model. Uh, 
uh, it can be smaller, it can be the same size, even like we can use larger models as well. Like uh, there are some setups that knowledge distillation can improve, uh, like uh, even larger uh, students. Uh, so that being said, let's compare knowledge distillation with regular uh, training partners. So in regular uh, training, we have just uh, a single, so let me just uh, turn on my laser point. So yeah, uh, so we have just a single network and it's trained on cross entropy, uh, but uh, in knowledge distillation, Aside from the training data uh, and the one hot label which comes uh, with that, uh, we have uh, the output of the teacher model. So the student would try to follow uh, both the label and also the output of the teacher. So uh, if we call the label from the data set like a hot label because it's just one hot, so just one class, uh, is correct and the other classes uh, uh, would be uh, actually uh, zero. Uh, so like the teacher output would be soft label because uh, the teacher output would be continuous. Uh, so we call the output of uh, the teacher soft target and uh, this soft target uh, like as uh, Hinton mentioned uh, like uh, in 2015, it has some sort of dark knowledge, uh, which is a bit, I would say, yeah, it's a sort of extra information about class similarity that doesn't exist in uh, hard label, uh, let's say, uh, annotation. Uh, so uh, that being said, uh, I think uh, now uh, we know how knowledge distillation works mostly. So in knowledge distillation, the, uh, the thing is like instead of having just cross entropy, we would have a, a convex combination of cross entropy and the KD loss. Cross entropy would try to match the output of a student with the label and the KD loss is just the KL divergence uh, between the output of the student and the output of the teacher. Here we have one more term like uh, the temperature parameter tau, which controls the smoothness of the output of teacher and student. So uh, again, so for my talk, uh, I don't uh, need temperature much, but uh, that's a way to uh, control the smoothness and like it's a hyperparameter. So well, let's come back to uh, our uh, original problem. Uh, and uh, that was like how we can fit these pre-trained language models into devices. And we said, okay, we are going to use knowledge distillation as one potential solution. Uh, then uh, actually uh, you might ask, uh, so if we have vanilla KD, uh, then uh, what's the point of uh, all other variants of knowledge distillation in the literature that we see uh, every day. Uh, so uh, what's wrong with KD? Uh, why can't we just use knowledge distillation in original form and apply to our pre-trained language model and uh, we, we compress uh, to the size that we want? So the major issue uh, I try to just summarize from uh, summarize the uh, major problem here in one table. Uh, I borrowed from one of our uh, recent submissions. Uh, the thing is, Vanilla KD does not work uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, pre trained NLP models, like pre trained language models. Uh, if you compare it with fine tuning, so I have just uh, one summary uh, for uh, Distill Roberta uh, and uh, where it's pre-trained and we apply knowledge distillation uh, and uh, actually uh, fine tuning. Uh, so uh, we did, uh, we ran our experiment five times and uh, just to show the evidence to you that uh, basically KD works on par with fine tuning uh, when your model is pre-trained. Uh, so the other thing is like KD is very sensitive to the size of uh, your, uh, uh, let's say, output model, the size of your student model. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, improve the performance if the cap uh, if the gap between the student and the teacher uh, is very large, which would be the case, for example, for uh, GPT-3, if you want to uh, compress GPT-3 into distilled GPT, which has just six layer. So that being said, we need to think of variants of KD. Uh, we need uh, some auxiliary loss or some auxiliary ways to improve knowledge distillation. And we identify, so in our team, actually, we, work, uh, we worked at least one year on uh, how to improve knowledge distillation for pre-trained language models. And the result of that was like a sort of efficient KD toolbox uh, that I'll introduce at the end um, that can be uh, actually applied on top of like any of Hugging Face repositories that you're working with. Uh, so uh, we can improve knowledge distillation from three perspectives, from training perspective, uh, from the model structure itself and from a uh, data uh, point of view, like which would be mostly uh, noisy data or data augmentation. So uh, the focus of uh, my work uh, or my presentation here uh, would be on uh, this uh, third item, actually the data uh, point of view. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, I uh, moved to data augmentation uh, for NLP to briefly uh, review uh, like uh, data augmentation techniques uh, that uh, are mostly used in NLP. And then we go to like how we can use data augmentation with knowledge distillation and what would be a specific to knowledge distillation there. So uh, as you uh, know, like data augmentation is used to uh, like improve generalization of neural networks. Uh, we have a lot uh, or like, yeah, like uh, ma many different types of data augmentation techniques in the literature. Uh, most of them uh, are proposed in computer vision domain. We have also uh, a lot of particular data augmentation techniques for NLP. Uh, I uh, categorize existing solutions to like heuristic based, model based. Um, in terms of heuristic based solution, uh, I would say general like data augmentation in NLP would be much more difficult that com than uh, computer vision. Uh, the reason might be the discreteness of text. Uh, so for image, actually, uh, if you have, uh, apply a small perturbation to your image, uh, still the uh, it, it won't change. Most probably it won't change the uh, understanding of the human from that image. Uh, if you cut the image, if you like rotate the image, if you play with the RGB intensity, even if you like mix two images together, you still can understand it uh, very similar to the original sample that uh, uh, you want it to augment. But for NLP, that's not the case. Let's say I have a sentence. If I replace even a single word of that uh, uh, sentence, the, there is a chance that the meaning of the sentence change, like, this, uh, in term, like the semantic of the uh, sentence go from positive to negative, like that uh, can create uh, trouble for the downstream task that you want to apply data augmentation. So in terms of heuristic based sol uh, solution uh, or data augmentation for uh, NLP, we have like uh, synonym replacement, easy data augmentation that we randomly like perturb some tokens. Um, and that's one category. We have another category uh, that it's model based so that you use some auxiliary model uh, to augment uh, your training uh, data uh, or to generate the train uh, the augmented sample for you. Uh, so for model based solutions, uh, some are task agnostic, some are task aware. What do I mean by task agnostic? Uh, so uh, by task agnostic, I mean the process of generating uh, augmented sample would be independent of the task that you are going to solve or the model that you are going to uh, basically tackle. 
So uh, that's what uh, I mean by task agnostic. There are many of these uh, task agnostic model based solution like retrieval based augmentation, back translation. So for example, for back translation, you feed your uh, input uh, data to uh, a translator, you go to a second language and then you come back to the original. So in this process, this uh, augmentation process uh, can be done completely blind to uh, like the model you want to uh, deploy at the end or the task you want to solve actually. Uh, the same, uh, so for retrieval based augmentation, I uh, present this in my later slides. For contextual data augmentation uh, with the emergence of like uh, uh, BERT based models uh, and these contextual like pre-trained language, uh, sorry. Uh, with these contextual pre-trained language models. Um, basically, uh, you can uh, mask your input feed to uh, feed your sentence to BERT and uh, BERT would generate for you some new candidate or some augmented sample. Uh, for uh, the task ever uh, augmentation techniques, we have adversarial data augmentation like uh, free LB that you might be aware of or unsupervised data augmentation from Google. Uh, again, that they use a sort of consistency loss. Uh, they don't uh, necessarily play with the augmentation part, but inter when they want to deploy their augmented sample, they use consistency loss. So uh, these are just a brief uh, uh, let's say review of data augmentation in NLP, uh, but let's see what's the relevance to uh, our discussion and why it's important for knowledge distillation. So, um, do you, sorry to yes. interrupt you. You have no. about seven minutes left. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah, tell. yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's that's. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah. So for. Uh, data augmentation uh, in knowledge distillation, uh, actually the main thing is uh, these data augmentation techniques are designed for uh, the task which has just single network, but not for the cases that you have a student and teacher. No, they're not designed for, uh, let's say, uh, knowledge distillation type problems. What's different in knowledge distillation? Let's just see a quick example. So here we have one uh, function. Uh, so I'm just showing you one diagram uh, to uh, illustrate the problem a bit better. So let's say we have a teacher, we have a student, uh, the teacher uh, function and the student function uh, based on the knowledge distillation loss should match uh, around the input data. So basically the KD loss would enforce these two functions to cross each other around the training point, but not in other input areas that you don't have training data sampling. Uh, so we, that's the uh, data gap problem that we say uh, if the goal of knowledge distillation is to push a student to follow the teacher, it would happen around the training data, but not uh, in other uh, input spaces. So uh, that's why we believe that uh, we can uh, uh, somehow uh, improve data augmentation in NLP uh, if we make it aware of the student and teacher function. The other issue would be sample efficiency and uh, sample efficiency uh, would be important for the training speed like how many I mean the main question would be uh, how many samples should I uh, generate how many augmented samples should I generate per training data? Uh, and the last point here would be about uh, semantically meaningfulness of the generated augmented sample. So there is no guarantee in most of the, uh, let's say, techniques I introduced that they keep uh, like the uh, semantic meaning of like the, or they can control the output, the meaning of uh, meaningfulness of their output. Uh, so uh, this being said, at least for the first two, for the data gap problem uh, and having uh, data augmentation uh, or KD specific data augmentation, uh, 
uh, we proposed mate KD based on a simple minimax technique. Uh, so minimizing the maximum expected loss, uh, how it works. So in regular training, we have teacher and a student. Uh, here we use a generator to uh, basically generate our sample. This generator is, a sim is simply a BERT model uh, and we mask our input. Uh, but the thing is we tune this generator in a way uh, that the output of uh, this generator would lead to the maximum divergence uh, between the teacher and student output. So that would guarantee that we identify uh, the regions in the input space uh, or we generate data around the regions in the input space that uh, like the two functions diverges uh, maximally from each other. So then those would be uh, our worst case examples. Uh, so we just generate augmented data around those worst case regions. And then in the minimization phase, so I have two step maximization phase for generating uh, like worst case examples, like for my data augmentation uh, part. And then in minimization step, uh, I have just regular knowledge distillation. So like the KD loss and the cross entropy loss that I try to match these two over my uh, main training data plus augmented samples. So it's very simple uh, technique. So we uh, actually examine the performance of uh, the model on the glue task. I assume that you know uh, the glue task, uh, glue tasks actually already. Uh, so with this simple technique, uh, actually we can outperform um, uh, most of, or at least uh, to the best of our knowledge, all state of the art uh, data augmentation techniques uh, on top of pre-trained language models, like with a good margin. Uh, and we had like rank one on uh, glue leaderboard uh, as well, like till very recently. Uh, so I so, uh, made KD outperform SOTA. Uh, but it needs a generator and the output of mate KD is not necessarily semantically meaningful. So that's the, uh, I have a few examples here for you to see uh, how the original sample is and we mask a portion of the input and then we uh, generate basically our augmented sample corresponding to original data, uh, but it won't keep the uh, meaning of uh, the sentences. So uh, that was the motivation for our second work on sample efficient data augmentation that we wanted to target sample efficiency and also interpretability of augmented data. Uh, so we thought that the retrieval based augmentation techniques uh, uh, can resolve at least the interpretability thing and uh, considering the fact that in NLP we have a lot of uh, like uh, available text in the uh, uh, like in open web. Uh, so then uh, we thought maybe we can uh, use the retrieval based augmentation and then we work on the sample efficiency uh, and especially uh, the main issue with the retrieval based augmentation technique would be like it's really blind to the student model. Uh, uh, like uh, in general, like the output of a student model. So we can somehow take that into account into our solution. So again, we take the minimax minimum, uh, minimizing actually maximum expected loss thing. So the loss would be the same, uh, but we will try to, uh, before in made KD, we were generating like uh, uh, actually augmented samples in the uh, in the input space for the regions that these two functions would uh, diverge. Uh, here we, uh, from actually our KNN uh, extracted uh, or augmented samples, we would only keep those which leads to the maximum divergence of a teacher and a student. So our process would be very simple for each training data. Uh, first, we retrieve the most related, the KMO, the top uh, K most related sentences from our universal sentence bank. And then from those K samples, based on this uh, uh, actually uh, minimax loss, we would choose just 
K1. So K1 would be much less than K. Uh, and they, uh, these would be the samples which have the maximum, uh, di which would lead to the maximum divergence between the teacher and a student. So uh, that being said, uh, I, uh, so we applied it on many different text classification tasks and um, we uh, could show that so for sure data augmentation can help uh, vanilla knowledge distillation uh, but uh, with our own uh, let's say sample efficient minimax uh, data augmentation like retrieval based approach uh, instead of like uh, basically augmented augmenting eight sample uh, we were choosing half of it and uh, we were able to like outperform the previous uh, data augmentation result and we could improve the training time for more than 25 percent so that was actually the uh, initial uh, let's say work that we did on um, sample efficiency for data augmentation we had follow-up works for this year ACL, but I couldn't actually present because it was under anonymity period thing uh, and commitment uh, actually a promise. So I couldn't present uh, that, but the main thing is how to apply this sample efficiency, how to generalize it to all data augmentation techniques and having a sort of universal sample efficient technique, not just for retrieval based approaches. That's the follow up work that hopefully uh, would uh, come out uh, after. Uh, so in, to summarize, basically I introduced knowledge distillation uh, and uh, basically I mentioned that why knowledge distillation uh, why we might need actually a, a extra, let's say, uh, techniques to improve knowledge distillation uh, and uh, from the three perspective of data structure and training uh, I just focused on data and for data efficiency uh, I introduced two solution mate KD and minimax KN and KD for mate KD uh, we targeted a data augmentation technique which uh, is designed for knowledge distillation and we solved the data gap problem in minimax we tried to resolve the interpretability issue for uh, data augmentation and sample efficiency. Uh, in our future work, actually, we also tackle like noisy uh, data for knowledge distillation when we have label noise. Uh, so uh, because of time, I don't go uh, to uh, that noisy KD thing. And uh, the codes of uh, our, like at least ha the data related codes for our efficient uh, KD uh, toolbox uh, are published in our uh, GitHub repository and the other solutions for structure and training are also coming after so we are uh, publicizing our codes. So what I presented was the great work of our team uh, and uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you so much Mitch. it's really impressive, really impressive work. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have time for about one question. One question. Sure. So I think I'm oh, going to ask that, that question. Ask that. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Could, could you tell us a little tell more about the generator? generator? Yes, the generator, uh, you mean uh, here in the mate KD, right? Uh, so exactly. the generator is, is BERT, uh, is just a, a BERT based model. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's we can, fully we just, differentiable. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, here it's fully differentiable. Yes. Great. You can use GPT as well, but, uh, or any other generator, like generative uh, address, like GAN based uh, generators as well, but we used uh, BERT. I see. There would be probably more questions, however, and during, and during interest of time, I think uh, sure. I'm going to wrap up, Mehdi. Thank you again for I your presentation. No, you're welcome. Thank you for your invitation. So, so sure. we're going to move on now to the third presentation by Mathieu Forti. Um, I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to stop the recording, please.
and uh, Mathieu is going to present uh, Productizing Modern NLP.